If you were here last week, you will remember that Saul had a big experience, and now we call him Paul. And that he became a Christian on the road to Damascus where he encountered Jesus. And then you heard just a little bit ago Saul or Paul now giving a farewell speech. Uh oh, what happened? You know, he, he knows that his life is coming down to the very few days. He, he doesn't know when it will happen, but he is sure that he will die. And being who he is, and all the people that he has met, and he has, he has really cared about and loved them, the very leaders that he has placed in all these different churches, he gathers them from Ephesus for this farewell speech. And he says to them, and now you know how I lived among you when I was, from the very first day that I entered the province of Asia, and I... I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of the, my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. Well, what on earth has Paul been preaching that, that now is just so scandalous that he has these opponents who are seeking and plotting to take his life and will succeed in that end. Well, that question is a little hard to answer of what he preached. And it's not because, well, we don't know what he preached. It happened so long ago. We don't have his sermon notes. No, we, we have what he wrote. We have his message. This is a really hard question to answer Because as you and I in this room hear what Paul has to say, there are already so many assumptions well locked into place. These have been in place for about 500 years since, you know, Martin Luther and the Reformers. It has been since that time that the preaching of Paul has been in a very narrow and specific, almost laser-like focus of a a personal salvation story for individual sinners that goes something like this. The blood of Jesus was shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. When you die, you are with Him forever in heaven and the new creation. Sounds familiar, right? Right, I mean, that's, that's been the story. And, and for the first people who heard this preaching of Paul in such a way, oh, It was revolutionary for them. I mean, they'd been hearing sermon after sermon at that time that, hey, the sinner, you you need to cover the cost of your own sins through penance and prayers, through payments of of money. And the reformers, they, they took the hearts and the lives and the souls of these poor people and they pointed them to the the preaching of Paul and they said, Look, look, the Jesus himself has opened the storehouses of God's grace. Forgiveness is yours, complete and full, through Jesus alone and his grace. This is most certainly true. And while we hear these words, they do comfort our hearts, over time... It seems that there's been something kind of strange going on as we hear these words in our modern hearing in that it tends to kind of divide our lives into like real life and your faith life. This division happens because, well, you know, in your faith life, Jesus has done it all for you. You've got your golden ticket to heaven now, so keep that safe with faith. And and now, then you have your your real life. Like, this is taken care of, right? Faith's good. But unfortunately, most, well, fortunately, most of us don't die right away and go on to heaven. We have quite a long life to live. And now, we find that we have a lot of ambition ambitions and and stuff we want to do in this life. You know, we 
We want to make a lot of money, right? Right? Okay, I mean, and, and that's what most people start off, well, I want to have a great life. I want to have a, I want to have a house someday and, and a family and, and all these things and uh, that I'm, I just want to pursue it and, and I want to have more and more. Yes, we all want to fulfill the American dream, right? And, and it seems all very legitimate too, even God-blessed. And, and, and we, we find ourselves then in real life kind of in charge of the agenda. And with, with this in mind, it makes a lot of sense, the questions that we ask our kids. You know, a young kid, you might ask her, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? I mean, you've been asked that. You've asked kids that question. Now, we ask that question rather than the second question that I have up there. How are you going to use your God-given gifts in service to his kingdom when you grow up? Two very different starting points from that for those questions. One is, what are you going to do? And the other is, what are you going to do in God's kingdom? See, we don't even ask that second question normally because life for us is fulfilling our dreams. And as you set about living a life fulfilling your dreams, there is a real expectation and you know it's it's reasonable that your your dreams are going to be fulfilled right and and, and we kind of had this assumption about life that it's on this ever ever upward spiral staircase of progress of getting better and better over time and historically we have some good evidence for that I mean we're still not in horse and buggies are we it's a lot nicer to get into a nice air-conditioned car Okay, and, and you know, life is getting better. I mean, just look at your cell phone. That is not a flip phone, is it? You know, and it's no cord on that thing. Life gets better. And, and, and the software, it just gets new every time. And, and every so often, you get an update. You know, we, we have this real expectation then that that's what life is. It's this dream fulfillment. It's going to get better over time, and, and it's going to go from version 1.0 to 2.1 to 3.2, and, and on and on, until it doesn't. And then that really bothers us, because we had this, not, it wasn't just a hope, it wasn't just a dream, it was a demand, actually. See, when, when my life isn't getting better, then I've got a problem and the whole system's broken, and it's got to be fixed, and, and we've got to blame somebody, and we've got to fix somebody, and then we got to, and then there's this depression and cynicism, like, ah, but it's okay, we can turn to our faith life, right? I mean, when real life's really bad, you always got your faith life, and so you go there, and, and you turn to it, or rather, turn on it, and, and demand that God do something about real life, if he's this God that loved you so much, sent his son to die for you, and now you can go on to heaven when you die. But at that point, the, the, the gap between real life and, and your faith life, it's just too far apart to be relevant to each other if you've just been living your own life and your own agenda. It, think about it. Oh, how helpful is it to to be going through a really tough time, and then to have like a preacher say, well, you know, it's going to be better in heaven someday. Is that, is that comforting? Is that like, oh, you're right. What was I thinking? You know, I have another 30 years to live is what I'm thinking. And, and how is that relevant? And, and, and you, get to th you get to really getting uh, angry. Well, is that what Paul preached? Is that really what he, all he had to say? Is that all we have to give to our, our children and, and our community? Because if we're going to be honest with everybody here, I mean, you don't actually have to be Christian to have that story. Lots of religions have uh, hang on till heaven stories, you know, and nirvana is going to be better, and, and the bliss of the afterlife, even for a Muslim, is going to be better than this. And, and so, really, that's what Paul preached? Well, of course not. We know what he preached. And it wasn't anything like that. In fact, I'm going to put it up here because it was in the text. It was just read to you. He said, I have declared the truth to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in the Lord Jesus. 
Now, repentance means to change the way you think. This, the way you think, eh, see, that, that's a lot different than a slogan of hang in there till heaven. See, that, that repentance word calls us out and says, hey, you are completely and utterly wrong about real life and faith life. They're not two, they're one. And it really is scandalous to my expectations then of what I thought life was really about because then I'm not the one setting the agenda. I, in my life, isn't about me fulfilling my dreams of financial success, of business success, of family success. Well, it really upsets everything in, in my sensibilities to think this world isn't on a course of getting better and better and better. And really, it insults <clears throat> my morality of what I think is right and what I'm going to do with my body and my money and my time while I'm here. You see, what Paul has to say in this preaching of repentance isn't, you know, well, you, you just picked the wrong path. You need to, you need, you know, you had some assumptions that weren't right, but here's some better assumptions. No. It is a total and absolute challenge to everything about you, what you thought about the world and your religion. That's the reason the Jews were opposing him, seeking to kill him. That's the reason you and I often dismiss what Paul has to say. Um, but the point of this preaching of repentance, or better yet, there is a person behind this call to repentance. You see, it is, it is a call to turn from this to the person of Jesus, who has a kingdom, which is another way of saying a real life to live, in which he, like a shepherd, is tending to our everyday needs of food and shelter, that he's, he's tending our hearts and leading us somewhere. And uh, yes, of course, he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Yes, your sins are forgiven, but there is so much more to his kingdom than when you die, you'll get to be with him forever and it'll be great. You see, Jesus has a dream, and it's so much better and bigger than the American dream. It has nothing to do with one country or, or one particular group of people. The dream of Jesus is that all people of the entire earth would be valued so greatly that none would be left out or excluded from His forever kingdom. And that as we value each and every person, that there would be special attention given to the most vulnerable and the weak among us, the old and the sick, the orphan, the, those who can't care for themselves, the alien in our midst, and that this care in His kingdom would be given by those who have the resources. You see, this is about real life, about your pocketbook, about your house and who's living there, about how you care for one another and the time and attention we give to one another here in this congregation. It is the dream of Jesus that as we are living with Him, that we learn what it means uh, that it is far more blessed to give than to receive. And that in living with Him in His kingdom, we'll find that, well, there, there is this progress. There, there is this great change for the better, but it's not in the world or in its institutions. It's in the human heart that absolutely everybody who's with Him in an interactive, intimate relationship, He is transforming the heart to be more and more like His own. So that if you're not becoming a more merciful and kind and loving and generous kind of person, you might check to see, well, am I really in the kingdom? Am I really with Jesus? Because that's what His dream is. 
that we all become more and more like him in our hearts as he's tending and shepherding us, forgiving all of our sins and leading us down a path that will never end because no one can snatch us out of his hands or the Father's hands. That's his dream. That's his change. That's his real life you've been invited into. And knowing that it is quite an ongoing day-to-day task, as you leave today, be sure to take one of the sermon take-homes for this week. It's on the table. And what it says is a question, how will I use my gifts to serve in God's kingdom today in real life? And then a prayer. Lord Jesus, our good shepherd, lead me into every good work that you have prepared in advance for me to do. So that's how Paul wrote to the Ephesians. He says, it is by grace you have been saved, not through good works. No one can boast. You've been saved for the good works that Jesus has prepared in advance. You've been saved for his kingdom. You've been saved for the transformation. You've been saved for love and mercy and service. Please take one of the cards home and and pray this week and see the good shepherd tend to your soul. Amen. We stand then to confess.